So first thing we're going to talk about, we're going to spend today and tomorrow basically talking about what a sampling distribution is. Like we said, it's going to be an extremely important topic. Everything we do from here on is kind of based on this idea of sampling distributions. So we need to understand what they are, what they represent, how to work with them, and then how we can use them to make inferences. So with sampling distributions, we kind of start off with an example from your book. So it says, what's the average income of American households? Each March, the government's current population survey asks detailed questions about income. The random sample of about 60,000 households contacted in March 2012 had a mean total money income of $69,677 in 2011. Now, that $69,677 describes the sample, but they use that sample to estimate the mean income of all households. Okay? So what we're doing here is we're talking about this idea of taking a value we collect from a sample and using it to infer about the overall population. That's going to be kind of our goal. Okay? So what they're saying is they looked at individuals within or in 60,000 households. The mean income for those 60,000 households was $69,677. So they assume that the mean for the entire population would be somewhere around $69,677. That's kind of what we're talking about here. Now, before we get into sampling distributions, all the way, we have to go back and kind of talk about a couple of things. These are some ideas we talked about last semester, or touched on, so I'll go back and talk a little bit. When we talk about statistical inference, that's what this entire second semester is going to be about. What can we infer about the population value? So it involves using information from a sample to draw conclusions about a wider population. So we have some population of interest here in the blue box. We're going to take a sample because either the population might be too large, might be too spread out, it's not feasible to contact all of them, so the best we can do is a smaller version. Okay, So what we do is we take that small, hopefully representative sample. So one of the things that we have to make sure we uh, check on is that the sample is representative of the entire population. So we're assuming that it comes from an SRS of some kind some type of randomization was used in the sampling process. So we collect that data, and then we use that data to make an inference about the population. So here's what our sample said. So we believe this to be true of the population. That's kind of the goal. Everyone kind of understand that? So when we talk about statistical inference, we're saying from a sample, what conclusions can we draw for the entire population? Now, one of the things that we also discussed last semester was that if we take different random samples, they're going to yield different statistics. So if I asked each one of you guys, if I gave you a list of all the students in the school, and I said perform an SRS, okay, you would all perform an SRS and say I wanted you to go find 10 students in the school. So you would list or label all the students, you'd create an SRS, you'd go find your 10 students, and then you'd measure like height or some aspect or some variable that we're talking about. So you would each go out and find 10 students, measure their height, calculate the average. Well, when you do that, is Blake's average height going to be the same as Eli's? Not their height specifically, <laughs> their sample height. Okay. So if Blake went out and got 10 students and he calculates the average height, Eli goes out and gets 10 students and calculates their average height, is it likely that they're going to have the same average? <laughs> Probably not, okay? If they're getting 10 completely different students, or even if they have students that are uh, overlapped, they're still probably not going to get the exact same average height. Now, those averages that they get might be close together, but they might be fairly far apart, too. Blake might have gotten a sample with a lot of tall people. Eli might get a lot of people with, or a lot of shorter people, okay? So they might have a big difference as well. What we're saying is, each random sample is going to create a different statistic. So if we think about that, if I were to go out into my population and take one sample, 
I'm using that one sample to make an inference about the entire population. But can I guarantee that the statistic I calculate, the value, truly represents the overall population? And the question is not necessarily. Okay? So we need to be able to describe the sampling distribution of possible statistic values in order to make that inference. So we use sampling distributions to determine whether our particular value is useful or not. Can we use that value to infer about the population? So, before we get into what exactly a sampling distribution is, again, some terminology, some review from last semester. Parameters and statistics. What was a parameter? So the data collected from the population. So a parameter was whatever value you were trying to calculate, but you calculated it from your population. So if I went out and actually obtained the heights of every single student in this school, that average height that I would calculate would be a parameter. I gathered it from the entire population. But if I did that same process, but instead of getting every single kid in the school, I went out and only took 100 of the kids. Then when I calculate that average height, that came from a sample, so it is a statistic. So this is review from last semester. If you need to rewrite it down, that might be a good idea. But a parameter is a number that describes some characteristic of the population. So it's a value that we calculate after having all the information from our population. A statistic is a number that describes a characteristic of a sample. So when we look at these, we use statistics to estimate parameters. So parameters are the values we get from the entire population if possible. A statistic is a value we get from a sample of our population. Now, some very important notation. This is something that we kind of touched on last semester, but you definitely need to understand now. With notation, a parameter is notated differently than a statistic. Now, the two types of values, the two types of characteristics we're going to deal mostly with are means and proportions. Those are going to be kind of our focus, so that's why I put these two up here. So if we're talking about a population mean, if we're talking about a parameter, and that parameter of interest was the mean height or mean weight or mean whatever, if it's a mean, we use the symbol for mu. So if you see mu equals some number, they're telling you with the notation that that is a parameter value. That number came directly from the population. If we take it from a sample, we're going to use x bar to denote the mean. So mu is a parameter, x bar is a statistic. And it's very important that you can differentiate between the two, because they won't always tell you where the number comes from. They might just give you the notation, and you need to know x bar means this came from a sample, mu means this came from the population. Now, for por or proportions, that's the other type of characteristic we're going to deal mostly with. If it's a population proportion, then it's just simply P. So it's going to just be an italicized P. So that's going to stand for a population proportion. If it's a sample proportion, so if I went out and uh, calculated the proportion of students who are taller than 5 foot 6, so if I gathered the entire school and I counted up how many kids are taller than five foot six and divided by the total, that would be a population proportion. If I took a hundred kids from the school and I measured how many were larger or taller than five foot six, that would be a sample proportion. Okay? 
So that has the notation p hat. So it just has a little caret symbol above the p. Now, other types of characteristics we might calculate would be uh, like range, might be minimum or maximum, might be median, okay? And in those cases, they don't have specific symbols. So you would either say the population range or the sample range or the sample minimum and so on. So you just use the terms for those. But these are the two we're going to work mostly with, and they have notation, so we need to make sure we have the difference between when we're talking from population, when we're talking from sample. Does everyone understand that? All right. So, a little bit of practice here, because one of the things that we need to be able to do with statistical inference is identify the different important pieces of our scenario. So looking at other people's studies, what, did, what are we actually working with? So I'm going to put up some scenarios here I want you to identify. The population. So what's their population of interest? The parameter, now what we mean is what are we trying to measure for the population? So when they're asking for the parameter, they're saying what are you actually trying to measure? I want the sample, so who did they actually get information from? And then the statistics, so what value did they calculate from their sample? Okay, so here's the first scenario. The Gallup poll asked a random sample of 515 U.S. adults whether or not they believe in ghosts. Of the respondents, 160 said yes. Okay, so if we're looking at this scenario here, What would be our population of interest? Yeah, all U.S. adults. Okay. So usually our population is simply the sample with the word all in front of it. Okay, so all U.S. adults. Now, that's our population of interest. What parameter are we interested in calculating or estimating in this case? So what are we trying to measure? Okay, so we're looking at the people who believe in ghosts, right? So what we're looking at here, they said of the 550 respondents, 160 said yes. So what would we be able to calculate knowing 160 said yes out of 515 adults? The percent or the proportion of people. So when you're looking at this, like I said, means and proportions are going to be kind of our main thing. So what we're looking at, our parameter of interest is the proportion of all U.S. adults who believe in ghosts. Okay. So the parameter that we're trying to measure is what's the proportion of all U.S. adults that believe in ghosts. So when you're looking at listing these things out, your parameter is almost always going to be some type of statement. What are we trying to measure? And the reason for that is the parameters very, are usually unknown. We usually can't access the entire population, so we don't know the true value. We can only say what we're actually trying to find. So now what was our sample? That'd be the 515 randomly chosen adults. Okay. And then the last thing is, what was the statistic? Yeah, so the statistic is the proportion of the sample who believe. Okay, so the statistic we're interested in is the proportion of the sample who believe. 
So basically the difference between parameter and statistic, the per parameter is the proportion, the mean, the range of the entire population. The statistic is going to be the proportion, the mean, the range, the minimum of the sample. Now in this case, we can even go a little farther. We can calculate the sample proportion because it told us how many out of the total believe. So if I'm going to do a statistic, what's my notation going to be for this? If I'm looking at a sample proportion, p hat. So p hat is equal to 160 over 515, which you can plug into your calculator and get a decimal approximation for. Okay, so p hat would equal 160 over 515. This is a statistic, so it needs to have the statistic notation. Okay with that? Okay. So here's the next one. During winter months, the temperature outside the Starnes' cabin in Colorado can stay well below freezing. So 32 degrees Fahrenheit or 0 degrees Celsius for weeks at a time. To prevent the pipes from freezing, Mrs. Starnes sets the thermostat at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. She wants to know how low the temperature actually gets in the cabin. So a digital thermometer records the indoor temperature at 20 randomly chosen times during a given day. The minimum reading is 38 degrees Fahrenheit. So, what is my population? Well, be more like the parameter. What's the, so the population, so if you have trouble with the population, think about what the sample looked like. So sometimes it's easier to identify the sample. What was the sample? 20 randomly chosen times during a given day, right? So the thermometer just randomly at some point during the day, 20 different times, measured the room's temperature, okay? So if the sample was 20 randomly chosen times, my population would be all times during a given day. So if I could account for every single second of the day and measure the temperature, that's what we're talking about population-wise, okay? So our population is all times during that given day. What's the parameter we're trying to calculate? Specifically, what temperature, though? The minimum temperature. We want to know how cold it actually gets, right? So we're looking for the minimum temperature. So if we were able to record temperature at every single instant during a specific day, we would want the absolute minimum. What's the lowest it ever got, right? So the parameter is the minimum of all times during the day. What's the minimum temperature that occurs over all time? What is the sample? 20 randomly chosen times, we just discussed that. What's the statistic? The 38 degrees, the sample minimum. So of the 20 randomly chosen times, the minimum in that group was 38 degrees Fahrenheit. So the sample minimum would be 38 degrees Fahrenheit. That would be our statistic. Are we okay with that? All right. So sampling distributions. What we talked about was the goal. We need to be able to go out, gather a representative sample of the population, use what we calculate from that sample to estimate something about the meter, the total population. Okay? Now, how can X bar? So we're talking sample mean. How can a sample mean be an accurate estimate of mu? And the reason we ask that is different random samples produce different values of X bar. Like we talked about, if I was to ask you guys all to go out and collect a random sample and measure heights, you would all come back with different averages. So how can each one of your individual averages represent the true average if we were to go out and measure every single kid in the school? 
That's the goal. We want to make sure that what we find from our sample is truly representative of the entire population. So, what we need to ask ourselves, what would happen if we took many samples? So we have this idea of sampling variability. Every time I go collect a new random sample, I get a different value back that I'm trying to find. So sampling variability asks the question, if we took many random samples and looked at the overall, what would happen? So here we notice we're taking multiple different samples. Now notice some of it overlaps. So these people here would be overlaps between the different samples, which is fine, because we're looking at just taking an SRS. We're not trying to exclude people once we've selected them. So we take all these different samples. We want to know what would happen if we took the average of all those. So basically what we're saying is, Blake goes out and gets 10 students, finds their average. Eli goes out and gets 10 students, he finds, his, or finds their average. Sam does the same, Emma does the same, and so on. Then what we would do is we'd bring all of your averages and put them all together. So we take each average that you guys calculated from your sample and we'd average those and see what that value looks like. Okay? That's the idea behind a sampling distribution. So a sampling distribution, this is something you definitely want to make sure you know. This is something you want to write down. The sampling distribution of a statistic is the distribution of values taken by the statistic in all possible samples of the same size from the same population. So get that written down first and we'll talk about what that actually means. So reading through that, somebody tell me what this means in different words. Like in your own words, what does this mean a sampling distribution is? Kind of. Uh, you could think of it in terms of something similar to the law of large numbers. Now, law of large numbers says that if we produce a random event over and over again, eventually we get the theoretical outcome, right? Um, that's kind of the idea. It's not exactly the same because we're not talking about necessarily a random phenomenon here. Um, but you're on the right track. Okay. Getting closer. So think about this. I, I said we could go out and get every student's average height, right? So I could physically find every single student in the school, get their height, and find the actual population mean, right? So I can find the mean height of all students. But we could try samples. So I said I might send each of you out to get a sample of 10. Now, each of you selecting your own SRS is going to come up with a different sample, right? So then if I had my other AP class go out and sample 10 students at a time, and then I had any of my other classes go out and sample 10 students at a time, and I continued that process over and over and over again, eventually I would have accounted for every possible sample, right? If I'm taking 10 random students at a time, eventually I'm going to account for every single student within those samples. Does that make sense? 
So what we're talking about with a sampling distribution, if we took every possible sample, so when I was talking about our example, if I sent you guys out to collect samples of 10 students at a time, well, if I went out and counter, uh, measured every possible combination of 10 students, so every possible combination that could happen with 10 students out of the school, if I measured all of them, I could calculate the sample proportion for each. And when I graph each of those different values, I create my sampling distribution. So basically it would be like if I went out and gathered 10 students, I calculate an average height. And I plot that average height on a number line. And then I go out and gather 10 new students, and I find that average, and I plot that average on the number line. And then I go out and gather 10 more students, and I take that average, and I plot it on a number line. And I continue that process until I've accounted for every possible outcome. What remains, what results, is the sampling distribution. So I would have a distribution, I'd have a picture that shows what that distribution of samples looks like. Okay, so when we talk sampling distribution, what you got to think to yourself is we're looking at every possible scenario, every possible sample of a certain size for a population. Okay, so to kind of visualize this, in the book, it goes to an example where you have a bag full of red and blue poker chips. So you have 100 blue poker chips, you have 100 red poker chips. So based on that information, we know that the proportion of red poker chips, for instance, is 50%. Okay? So we know the population proportion is 50%. Now, if I were to hand the bag to Blake, and I say, Blake, take uh, 10 chips from the bag. So he's just going to randomly draw 10 chips from the bag. He's going to record how many blues he got and how many reds he got. So let's say he did this first one. He grabbed, well, in this case, we're doing 20. So he grabbed 12 blues and 8 reds. So the sample proportion for Blake would have been the 8 reds out of the 20 total chips. So he found a proportion of 40%. So based on his sample, if I hadn't told you how many chips were in the bag, his estimate would be 40% red. So we would plot that 40%. We'd make a mark there. Then, let's say Eli does it. So in his bag, he gets 9 blues and 11 reds. Well, his sample proportion would be 11 out of 20, or 55%. So his estimate would be 55% of the bag is red. So we would plot 55%. And then Sam would do it. And in Sam's case, he got 7 blue and 13 red. So in that case, his sample proportion would be 13 out of 20, or 65%. So he would estimate 65% of the bag is red. And we plot that value. Okay, And then we continue that process over and over and over again. So we pass it to the next person, they would draw 20 chips randomly, and they would calculate their sample proportion. And every time they give us a new proportion, we just plot a new spot on our graph. And so what would result is something that looks like this. This is our sampling distribution. If we took samples of 20 over and over and over again, this is what our sample proportions would look like distributed over the entire process. Can everyone kind of visualize that? So we're talking sampling distributions, that's what we're talking about. We're taking multiple samples over and over and over again of the same size and just recording what values happened for each sample. Okay. Now, with sampling distributions, one of the things that's important is to be able to describe them. So if I wanted to describe this sampling distribution here, what would we say about its shape? So if we're looking at this, we're talking shape is, as far as not scatter plots. We're not talking about form like linear or nonlinear. We're talking about shape as in 
skewed or symmetric, right? So if I'm looking at this distribution, is it skewed or symmetric? Pretty symmetric. So it's unimodal, one peak, and pretty symmetric. So that's the description for shape. If we wanted to measure center, where would the center of this distribution lie? At about 0.5, right? Notice the center of my sampling distribution matched up with my overall proportion. So my sample proportions came out to have a mean equal to the actual population proportion. That's going to be a very important aspect that we're going to talk about more tomorrow. But it's something I want to kind of note today so you kind of get that in the back of your minds. With the sampling distribution for means and proportions, they're going to come out to be the same as what our population value becomes. Okay? So we've got shape, symmetric, center at about 50%. And then as far as spread, the only thing we can really talk about is range. So we can either calculate the range, or you can simply say that the proportions vary from about 15% to 80%. So you can either say the range is 65%, so 80 to 15, or you can just say the, the range of the value vary from the minimum to the maximum. So one of the things you're going to be expected to do, at least today, is take a sampling distribution and describe it. So what does it appear to look like shape-wise, center-wise, spread-wise? Okay with that? All right. So your assignment is going to be a worksheet. Mm -hmm.